Hello and welcome to this little relationship audit workshop. My name is Doris Fulgraber. I'm a relationship coach and I help smart romantics build happier, healthier relationships. Okay, on the agenda for today is the most important criteria for healthier, happier relationships, what's already working and how to bridge the gaps. And we're going to start in the present. If you want to take a deep breath, if you want to go in, whatever works for you and answer the following questions. What are the most important criteria to you for happier, healthier relationships? And now forget about every romance novel you ever read or movie you ever watched. What are the most important criteria for healthier, happier relationships? And now forget about your parents' expectations or the friends who just had that elaborate wedding. What are your most important criteria for healthier, happier relationships? One more. But now really, honestly, if anything were possible, quickly, easily and now, and if you knew that everyone involved would benefit and be thrilled for you, what would you really desire when it comes to your relationship? This is a recording. Feel free to stop the video at any time. I'm going to keep going. So these are questions that you can answer for your current partner or if you're single, your most recent or your ex. Bonus points if you're in a relationship, if you're doing it with both and or all partners involved and then comparing notes afterwards. Take a few minutes and think about how are you compatible What's already working, like what just seems to be going easily? And also, how are you incompatible and what seems to be a recurring fight that's coming up? So incompatibility reasons is usually uh, or issues that are coming up are usually around communication, conflict, intimacy and money. This might be something completely different for you. And from my online quiz, the last question is what is one thing that you wish you could magically change in your current relationship? And the top two responses are actually communication. And honestly, I wonder sometimes if I'm not standing in my own way and old baggage is sabotaging and otherwise generally actually good thing. And I love how honest that answer is because we are self-aware enough. Smart romantics are self-aware enough to know that sometimes we are the problem or we are the bottleneck. So in a coaching process, we might spend a whole session on figuring out what stage of a relationship you're in because the stage of your relationship actually affects these arguments like are you in your honeymoon or are you in the power struggle or is, is it a mature love? But for now, this can just be what it is and you can put it on paper and sit with whatever comes up for you. This is my favorite quote from Carl Jung. Everything that irritates us about others can lead us to an understanding of ourselves because really relationships, just uh, as a reminder, they're a dance, right? You move, I move, sometimes I lead, sometimes you follow, get it? The thing is our intimate partners are exquisitely well positioned to push all our buttons because we spend so much time together. Right. There is just the point where our real self comes out as much as we want to put our best self forward during the dating process. Eventually, you can no longer hold the farts in, I like to say, um, when you live together. So, yes, sometimes being with your partner stinks. However, despite all the back and forth, we are also attracted to them for a reason and we have those buttons for a reason. So this is where a little fun exploration continues. In an ideal world, we choose our partners wisely, but in the real world, we cannot help who we are attracted to. And we tend to be attracted to the type of relationship we saw modeled in our homes and the type of love we received from our parents or caregivers. That is what is keeping our nervous system feel safe and balanced, even if that love was one sided or abusive. If that is what we're used to, then that is what we'll experience as safe and normal. Some of you will watch this because you want to change those scripts and patterns and hear me when I say you can absolutely do that. Only also be aware that uh, your brain likes to save energy and you will have to put a lot of energy into changing and rewiring those old, you know, grooves and, and narratives. So be patient. One workshop may not 
get you there, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. So take a couple of minutes to think of an example where you had an argument or a fight with your partner. We'll use that for the next exercise. And this may or may not repeat childhood patterns. It's just something to keep in mind. You and your partner are always showing up with at least three different versions of yourself. And you can see them on the slide here. For example, if our parents yelled at us or disappointed us or made us feel like we disappointed them, we might have shut down and gone to our rooms or start crying or have a huge temper tantrum. Today, if your partner yells at you or disappoints you or makes you feel like you disappointed them, do you do the same? Or what else do you do? The ad lib sentence is, of course, looking at what your child self needed at the time and how it experienced a similar situation when you were young and couldn't quite understand what was going on. Your teenage self is the one trying to protect you. There are coping mechanisms that you've learned that worked absolutely fine, but you might have outgrown them. Or since you've matured, you might have gained access to more appropriate ones. This is your adult self and what you might consider trying instead for the next fight. So fill in the blanks for yourself. And I give you an example here. When my partner yells at me, I feel rejected. I try to protect myself by insulting and rejecting them. Instead, I could try verbalizing my hurt and ask for a timeout to continue the conversation at a later date. So I'm going to give you a moment to do that. Because now we're moving forward into what we actually want, right? We, we talked about what was happening now and now let's move into what we actually want. So what I found in my marriage is that type, personality type, explains a lot of the underlying reasons why we interpret certain behaviors as triggering. And they're different between us. You've done a lot of work now, so I'd like to show you some examples from my type reports to give you non-judgmental language that you can use with your partner to describe where you're coming from. Just keep in mind the following two things. We made them bright pink. There is no better or worse, just different. Type preferences are preferences, not absolutes. Everyone can do everything. And one thing just comes more naturally. And that is not an excuse to dismiss your partner's needs and say, well, this is who I am. Just deal with it. Right. Also, it's not on purpose. It's just how our brains are wired. Remember, we're dancing and sometimes you lead a little more and sometimes your partner leads a little more. We don't have time for all the eight functions to look at, but here are the function attitudes. So extroversion, introversion differences show up in how we want to be social or not, our hobbies, and given the societal preconceptions and romantic notion that your partner is supposed to be the one you do everything with, this can trip some people up because, and this might sound weird, you don't have to do everything together. Shocking. But extroversion and introversion is also about communication. So if that was one of your incompatible pieces from earlier, this might explain some of it. This is the first slide. This is what it looks like when two people with extroversion preferences are together in a couple. Both will be active, tend to share thoughts and feelings out loud. They talk easily and get energy from one another and enjoy the company of others. Also, usually both extroverts will be busy and may a, not spend a lot of time together because they're out gallivanting with others and the groups and communities and societies that they're all members of. And B, there may not be enough quality alone time. So the partners may be competing for attention and not actively listening to one another. And that can result in some issues. Here's what it looks like when an extrovert and an introvert might be coupled up. So this is what it may look like. There is a lot of room for potential friction. However, the energies are balanced. So one will likely, the extrovert is going to encourage some interaction with others. And then the introvert is going to encourage calm reflection or time at home together, right? However, like I said, lots of room for potential friction because the interpretation of what constitutes quality time, privacy, patience, or how much talking is enough talking, those are different. This is what it looks like when two introverts are together. I had this question in another workshop some time ago. Do people with similar preferences have the best relationships then because they are so alike and there is less conflict? Well, not really, because even if you both have the same 
cognitive preferences, you're still individuals with different backstories. And the lack of variability also means you potentially have the same blind spots. So two introverts together may appreciate the need for a private time and space and can be alone together, but they also may hold back on verbalizing issues. And that means assumptions can fester until there is an emotional charge. So people are really activated and then a partner can feel cornered and or misunderstood. Judging and perceiving preferences often show up in how we interpret commitment, respect and trust. This one carries some strong cultural messages as well. So when I tell you that I'm a German J and my husband is a Spanish P, I'm not kidding, it's gnarly. But he taught me to relax a lot, which I'm super grateful for because some things don't have to be done right now, right? So nobody cares if I put the laundry away the same day or not. So two judging types together both value closure, decisions, clarity, making plans, stability and a sense of order. And as they reinforce one another, they may become rigid over time, jump to conclusions and have conflicting agendas, which can lead to power struggles. And then there is a neglect of uh, allowing for spontaneous joy as well, which when you pair a judging preference with the perceiving preference type, the, the energies again are balanced. So what the P's in the room have to understand about the J's is that being late or feeling like we're wasting time can be physically excruciating. We cannot just calm down and take it easy when our brains are pushing, just like you can't just hurry up or you know know how long it takes to get to the restaurant where people are waiting so the tip of course is to tell the p type the thing starts half an hour earlier than it does and then you can both be there on time and for the j to practice patience and stretching into the discomfort of maybe being late for something most often it's actually not the end of the world it just feels like it because the j likes to feel like we're in control all the time. But uh, yes, the J has a knack for planning and executing ideas while the P type has a knack for going with the flow and being patient with the emergent picture and bringing in last minute information as well, which is often very helpful. And again, room for friction because of the different interpretations of what's considered punctual, closure, duty, relaxation and structure. The two perceiving types together both value going with the flow, are open to new possibilities, have a flexible schedule, love to be spontaneous and enjoy their autonomy. And again, might reinforce each other in neglecting to finish projects, making decisions, keeping a commitment or setting and following rules. Especially if you are both NP types, the SPs actually love getting stuff done and getting seeing things happening in the real world. But um, yeah, I'd love to, to know how these resonate with you. So pulling together your notes from the previous exercises, you should be able to fill in these blanks now. Again, I'd love to read if you want to share any of them, please leave a comment and or send me an email. Here's an example, and this would be between an extrovert and an introvert. The most important criteria for a happy, healthy relationships are communication, space to grow and trust. We have the trust covered and to bridge the communication gaps, I can stop insulting and rejecting them and instead practice verbalizing my hurt, as we said before, asking for a timeout. And then to bridge the space to grow, I can stop shutting down and instead practice verbalizing my need for space. That doesn't mean I don't love them and make plans for quality time together. OK, I want to leave you with another quote that I think illustrates the evolving nature of human development. We can't know how things will turn out. We can only try to understand, learn from our mistakes and then move forward to make bigger mistakes and learn some more. What I hope these questions and type insights were able to show you is that you take yourself everywhere you go. So even if you decide to leave your current relationship, take some time to think about what it is that you're going to bring into your next one as well and see if you want to, to work on that with a professional. So marry and you will regret it. Don't marry, you will also regret it. Marry or don't marry, you will regret it either way. I hope you find this helpful. Find more resources and links to quizzes and newsletters where all I talk about is type and relationships on my website.